All right. Thank you everyone for joining us for tonight's Alberta Craft Council Monday meetup for our National Emerging Exhibition coming up next. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Alberta is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. Those of us joining from Alberta are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6, 7, and 8 territories, and all of us are beneficiaries of these peace and friendship treaties. The Alberta Craft Council is dedicated to ensuring that the spirit of these treaties are honored and respected, and we hope as individuals you join us in committing to learning, listening, reflecting, and taking actionable steps in truth and reconciliation. And of course, by celebrating and supporting the creativity of Indigenous craftspeople. I'd like to turn things over now to Jill Allen, our exhibition coordinator. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the events this evening. I'm so glad you could all be with us. I'm especially excited that we have so many of our exhibiting artists with us to enjoy uh, the evening and to talk about their work. Um, we're gonna show some images of the exhibition and then also some images of each person's work and have a moment to speak with each of the artists to describe their work and talk about how they learned to make craft. Um, and so we're just gonna begin our slideshow now. Coming up next on show at the Alberta Craft Council's Discovery Gallery in Edmonton until November 20th, 2021. This exhibition is traveling to the Alberta Craft Gallery in Calgary at our C Space location from March 12th to April 23rd, 2022. Tonight, we will show you images of the exhibition and each of the artists work as we discuss the show and take a moment to speak with each of the participants. This is the ninth coming up next a biennial exhibition of emerging fine craft artists from across Canada. And it is also the only national emerging craft exhibition in Canada. Some of the work is from the recent graduates of university art programs, and some of the work is from artists who learned to make their work through mentorship. Each of the artists presenting their work has committed themselves to evolving their skills and their ideas through working with their hands. And through this haptic experience in their medium, they have developed a body of exceptional original works. The participating artists hail from Alberta, Nova Scotia, Ontario, Saskatchewan, and British Columbia. We had a great response to the call and struggled to narrow it down to just 14 exhibitors. The beautiful works in the show demonstrate the strength of Canadian craft and are a testament to the value of nurturing diverse approaches to making and learning. 12 of the 14 artists in the exhibition are here with us this evening. Welcome everyone. <laughs> All of the artists' bios and statements are available on our website, and Anna will include a link in the chat. Next slide, please. This is the work of Marcy Friesen. Marcy was our invitation image artist, and uh, we were really struck by her beautiful images. We're so pleased that she could be a part of our show. Marcy Friesen is from Carrot River, Saskatchewan. She has two pieces in the exhibition. One is called Half Breed and one is called Kindness. Marcy Friesen is a swampy Cree and Welsh ancestry and currently resides on a mixed farm with her family near Carrot River, Saskatchewan. Marcy learned about beading from her family as a teenager, and later on as an adult, she learned about sewing, leather, and fur. She has a business, Trapline Creations, where she focuses on utilitarian objects such as clothing. Since visiting the Raimi Modern Art Gallery in Saskatoon, Marcy has changed her focus to creating useless pieces of art. 
Marcy has participated in the CARFAC mentorship program and Ruth Cuthand is Marcy's beating mentor. Hi, Marcy. I'm gonna ask you a question now. You could unmute your mic so that when you're ready to speak when, it's, when I finish asking a question. Marcy, can you tell us about the ideas behind your work, Half Breed? Hi, sure. So Half Breed is part of a series that I'm working on where I bead, I place beads directly onto my face. Um, it, it stems from my past when I was uncomfortable in my skin. I didn't like the looks of my brown skin. I, um, I was uncomfortable. And so as I grew and became more confident in myself, I, and started doing art and expressing myself in that in the in this way um it's to the point now where back then i was uncomfortable and i felt like a real half breed and i was called a half breed and but i accepted it because that's what i was and i'm so proud of my heritage now and so it's putting the beads directly on my face and being in the forefront is just really powerful to me and for me as well. Yeah, so I think that really comes through with the work. I think it's a really strong statement about your identity. And I, I just feel like uh, it's so um, unique and original as well to have the bead mixture right on your face. It's, I don't think I've ever seen that before. No, I had never seen it either. I was sitting in my workshop one day and I thought, I'm gonna bead my lips. So I beaded my lips and I'm always looking for ways to use my beads differently, hmm. differently than I've ever seen before. So I beaded my lips. I loved how they looked and I thought, oh, I'm going to bead my face. So I beaded my face and it kind of all stemmed and started from there. It, it really took off for me and I just loved the look of it so much. And yeah, I'm able to say a lot of different things through this way of art so yeah it's very powerful work um i was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about your experience with mentorship uh from ruth cuthand i worked with ruth in 2019 um she was my beating mentor uh and so much more um i learned so much from Ruth and she has pushed me and prodded me and reminded me to have fun throughout all of it. <laughs> so whenever I'm creating, I always think, okay, I can't, I need to do something different. Ruth has paved the way for contemporary indigenous, like for indigenous, indigenous women to do contemporary art. Mm -hmm. So I find in following her footsteps, I need to really pay attention to what I'm doing, do things with a purpose, and make art that has never been seen before with powerful statements. Well, I, success. I Thank think you. Definitely achieved those goals. And I'm really excited to see more of your work in, in coming years. I know you have a couple of exhibitions coming up uh, in Vancouver, I believe. And so, um, very excited for you. And maybe at the end of the uh, chat with the other artists, we can talk about everyone's upcoming opportunities and exciting things to share with everyone. Thanks so much for talking with me tonight. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the next artist we uh, have is Meng Q. Um, and this is a piece called Sunny Day Diary, page 69. Um, Mung sends her regrets. She couldn't be with us uh, this evening. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit uh, from her bio and her artist statement. Um, Mung Kyu received a BFA from NASCAD University in jewelry design and metal smithing. After receiving her Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry and environmental science at Acadia University in Nova Scotia. 
With Q's environmental science background, she's interested in upcycling paper. Q creates wearable art jewelry using discarded jewelry magazines and the folding techniques that she learned in her childhood in China. Meng says, with the folding and cutting experimentations, I discovered the strength and flexibility relating to the different sizes of paper forms. The elasticity of the helix structure adds playfulness to the body of work. I write down my thoughts and memories on paper strips with different colors of pens, folding them together to create a new form of a diary. Our next artist is Esther M. And this is a work called Quilt Without Border. Esther M. graduated from Ryerson University with a degree in urban and regional planning and has a diploma in digital design from OCAD. She learned about quilting through workshops and mentorship with Carol Ann Graham at Workroom in Toronto. Hi, Esther. <laughs> how are you doing? Are you there? Can you check? Hi, I'm here. I'm Hi. great. How are you? Good. I'm so glad you could join us. Thanks for taking the time to be here tonight. And thanks also for your beautiful work. Um, Esther, I was hoping you could tell us about Chogak Po and how this tradition relates to your quilt without borders. Um, yeah, like quilt. So quilt making often, um, it can be a very like precise, uh, mathematical process. Uh, when I started, it was all about following patterns and um, using like grid paper and calcul and a calculator, basically. So, oh. <laughs> like, I, so basically, I spent a lot of time reworking my practice to be more intuitive and experimental. Hmm. Um, and this work is a good example of that. Um, I use scraps um, from previous work to dictate the form of each new piece. So there's this like running li lineage that um, kind of forms between one piece and the next. Um, and as I began shaping my process and delving into the history of quilting, um, I learned of Chogik Po, um, which, is, um, which is like traditional Korean textile patchwork from scraps into col colorful abstract design. Um, which by definition is quite similar to what I make, hmm. even though in practice it looks a little different. Um, and it was neat to discover that there is this like rich history of quilting in my own Korean heritage, hmm. dating even further back than quilting in North America. Um, as I think quilting, I think quilting and patchwork um, is actually exists in like a lot of cult different cultures. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's. <laughs> That's really interesting. So you weren't necessarily aware of this uh, quilting tradition, Korean quilting tradition, until you started making quilts yourself. Yeah, like originally it was more like a local activity. Like I signed up to learn how to hand sew um, in a studio near my house. Um, and I thought of it in that like very, I guess, like uh, North American style of like stars and that traditional American style. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's kind of like what I like love about craft and humans, like humans make things and craft really kind of connects you to like history and other cultures. Mm -hmm. And I just find it really interesting that um, for me, it kind of like unintentionally brought me to my own culture. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> Do you, um? Do you think there's any influence from your experience uh, with urban planning in your work? Um, originally, I didn't really see the connection, but as I've shown my work, um, a lot of people have commented that it looks like maps and um, like this piece kind of has that like quality of um, like map and aerials. Um, my most recent work, people have commented that it looks like buildings. So I do think that there's definitely a linkage between like what we see and subconsciously like intake. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Well, thank you very much, Esther, for talking with us. Thank you for having me. Awesome.
All right. Uh, Adrienne, oops, Graham Boyd. Sorry, that's not Adrienne. Graham Boyd is a Calgary artist. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Alberta University of the Arts with a major in glass in 2020. And this work is titled Black, Chrome, Black and Chrome Stack. He's currently pursuing a second BFA at UA, uh, AU Arts with a focus in sculpture, as well as a minor in 3D design and fabrication. Hi, Graham. Are you there? Hello, Jill. How's it going? <laughs> I'm good. Uh -huh. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you for having us here. This is super exciting. Oh, I'm so glad you're excited. I'm glad you could be here. Yeah, me too. Um, Graham, can you tell us a little bit about optical phenomenology and the ideas behind black and chrome stack? Yeah, so a, a lot of my pursuits in glass throughout school and or throughout my BFA in glass and in my current practice, I guess, relate to the, the modes of seeing that humans have and the way we interact with the world via our optical perception and my current line of work which is um which black and chrome stack sits within is is based around this idea of uh the, the term coaxial which refers to items or objects sharing the same center point or axis so and i guess a big part of glass blowing is the center point and the, the the focus on that being on center as you can veer away from that. But one of the big things I like to focus on is the, the symmetry and the, the center. So using, using simple forms like cylinders and spheres and cones, I, I want to attempt to create objects and sculptures that, that use these forms together stacked at their center axes, I guess, to, to kind of embody a, a graphic like quality where the object almost reduces to its its purity of form like the silhouette or the negative space around the form and then using different color schemes or in this case uh black and chrome which are both highly reflective materials to kind of fill in that space the negative and the space within the silhouette to kind of again reduce that object and make it pop in a in a slightly graphic way and there's there's a lot more to optical phenomenology that my work pays attention to, but this this current direction that my practice is going in, it's with a, a high focus of purity of form and shape and mm -hmm. and the line around the object that again, as the viewer kind of navigates the object, it it's it's the same no matter where you are around the object, so it re reduces to its two D qualities and those those moments of interaction with you and the piece no matter where you are in space what i really noticed from this piece and, and really love about this piece is the way that it invites the negative space around it into its surface through the reflection and so as a viewer when you're when you're observing the work you can see yourself in the surface of the work and as you uh, circumnavigate the work uh, your reflection follows you so it's kind of it's an interesting interaction with the audience. I, I'm really glad that comes through because I guess, uh, again, a huge part of my work and I guess just artwork and craft and sculpture in general is it's inherently related to the body and the way we navigate the space that the work is in. So thank you, Jill. <laughs> and uh, I like your ideas about keeping things on center and that being sort of yeah. like something that comes out of the process because I, I feel like as a teacher, that is the sentence that I repeated the most often. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Center, keep it on center. So anyway, yeah, I, it's, it's kind of nice to hear. Think it's an internal. <laughs> in the context of the piece being finished as well. So anyway. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for talking with us, Graham, and for your beautiful piece. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. All right. All right. And the next artist we'll see the work from is Adrian Van Erve. Adrian's from Calgary. And this piece is titled Tissues 11. Adrienne is a graduate of the fiber department at AU Arts and has a Bachelor of Interior Design from the University of Manitoba. She has also attended the sculpture program at the University of Sydney in Australia. Adrienne will be exhibiting her work with us in the Discovery Gallery from January 29th to March 5th in 2022. 
So that's exciting upcoming show. Adrienne, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Right on. Good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, Adrienne, can you tell us about the concepts behind your series, The Tissues? Okay. Um, so I had been um, playing around with transparency for a few years um, when I was doing my second degree. Um, and I felt very fascinated by it. So I decided to buy a bunch of silk organza and try to make uh, three-dimensional sculptures and play some more with the transparency. So um, I had always loved to sew and I, I sewed clothes and pillows and whatever else. And so I wanted to sort of make something that was sketching um, with fabric. So I used thread and I dyed the inner areas with matter. And I wanted to do it very loosely, um, very imperfectly to sort of represent a body sort of feeling to it. And when it's hanging in the space, it kind of moves in a way that reminds you of a body. So inside you can see threads, which are kind of like veins. And this one is sort of like lungs to me. Hmm. It's interesting you say that they're like a body and that when they are hanging in the space, they move with the air like a body because I can see the shadow <laughs> of your piece in my peripheral vision as I'm as I'm sitting here. And uh, as the, the heater comes on and off, it's moving uh, subtly and I can I can see that movement and it is out of the corner of my eyes reminding me of a body. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. That's what yeah. I was going for. So. Um, I really love the translucency of your work. I think part of that is because I'm a glass artist and that really appeals to me, that idea of a transparent or translucent material. Um, but I think in your work, it makes for a really rich visual experience. Um, and I, I love the idea of, of sketching with the fabric. Um, and so the material that you dyed the interior uh, fabric with uh, you called that matter is that a very red dye yeah it's um I should know a little bit more about it but when I put the silk organza in like it took so little to dye the silk red it just took the it just soaked up the dye so easily and it was the perfect blood red so I was really excited yeah it's very it's very rich and bloody <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> very effective uh, for the message you're trying to get across. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing the rest of your work and the exhibit that we have happening early next year. And um, thank you so much for talking with us tonight and being a part of the show. Thank you so much. I'm really excited. Awesome. All right. So the next artist we're going to take a look at is uh, Sophia Lengel. And Sophia is an Edmonton artist. Um, this, the title of this work is Squares Within Squares. Uh, Sophia, Sophia Lengels is a Canadian artist based out of Edmonton. Sophia earned her BFA in fiber with honors from the Alberta University of the Arts in May, 2020. Um, Sophia, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Awesome. <laughs> so it's nice to see you again. Mm -hmm. uh, Sophia was kind enough to come in and, and do a video chat with me last week. And so we have some um, video of her talking about her work and experiences as a textile artist. And we'll be sharing those over social media and also on our YouTube channel uh, over the coming weeks. So you can look for those if you'd like to see some more um, from Sophia. Um, Sophia. You told me earlier that your piece took over 100 hours to complete. Um, can you talk about the process for your work, Square Within Squares? Yes. Um, I don't even know exactly how many hours it took. I was trying to figure it out recently because <laughs> I know it was at least 100, but I'm not sure if it's like 150 or almost 200. And um, I'm sure. Uh, doing this work like if I was to repeat and do this work again it wouldn't take as long necessarily but um, yeah I think the length it took also very much speaks to my approach to craft as well so it's not uh, oh it took 100 hours that's terrible it's like no that was like over 100 hours of growth and an experience with the work so um, this work is um, 
I actually warped it with a friend of mine. So I think we had some help because this warp was originally 40 feet long and quite wide. It was like a thousand, I think it was like a thousand five hundred threads or something like that wide. So that's a lot of threading. Wow. And um and the process, I was painting both the warp and the weft of the work to, to interlock the, the pattern to create this kind of like fuzzy effect so it's not so rigid. Um, and, and a theme in my work is really like repetition and iteration and the growth that can happen from doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And maybe that sounds like maddening, but, but it's really not. It's, um, I think it's like such an opportunity to learn about yourself your own endurance, as well as both materials you're working with and the ideas driving the work. So I hope that comes through. <laughs> I think it definitely comes through. Um, and so this um, technique of painting the warp, um, and the, I think you, you talked a little bit about using the technique called ECAT. Can you describe that a little bit for us? Yeah, so I was inspired um, by ECAT, but when you're using the ECAT technique, you're actually, um, you have bundles of, of your, your warp threads, and then you're tightly, tightly wrapping those threads um, to create a resist, and then you dye everything. And so then it's, it's very like mathematically planned out, or not necessarily mathematically, but it's like very, very precise. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was actually painting my warp and my, my weft instead of resist tying and dying um because with sumi ink uh that wouldn't work very well um so it was definitely inspired by japanese ecat uh but but i was not uh following the technique traditionally so that's really interesting that you took a traditional technique and sort of made adjustments to fit your design idea yeah yeah i think i learned a lot through trial and error <laughs> Well, Sophia, thank you so much for talking with us tonight and uh, taking the time to be here and uh, for making your beautiful piece. Yeah, thank you very much, Jill. All right. Uh, our next artist is Jillian Tolliver. Uh, Jillian is from Toronto, Ontario, and her work is titled Spirit Sprout. Uh, Jillian, are you there? Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Jillian Tolliver is a multidisciplinary artist currently based in Toronto. As an artist of mixed Scottish and Caribbean descent, her work often explores spaces existing in between a world caught in a moment of creation. Tolliver attended OCAD in drawing and painting. Jillian, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to see you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you learned to carve with wood? Yeah, so I grew up in a family of artists, so it's always kind of been around me. Um, and I would spend half the year, basically, well, not half the year, but a lot of the year growing up in Mapoose in Prince Edward County. Um, and there was an artist down there that was a family friend. Um, and he offered, when I was a teenager, to teach me, to mentor me um in stone sculpting so that was how I originally started getting into it I was always interested in sculpture um, but I finally had the tools for it and then once I graduated high school my parents gave me my first set of knives as like a congratulations so it's I've always loved practices that take a lot of repetition and a lot of labor so I, I took to it very quickly wow that's really interesting um, can you talk to us a little bit about the concepts behind the work Spirit Sprout? Mm -hmm. um, so I've always loved this quote by the author um, Barbara King Solver, and it's this forest eats itself and lives forever. Um, and she's talking about the Congo. Mm. But I just I got really obsessed with this idea of identity and psyche as being nourished by past selves and always being in this like constant evolutionary cycle of decomposition and regrowth um and I was just really interested in creating beings that would honor and represent this evolving self um so that's kind of where the idea for this one came from um and I'm also interested in just like I don't know being 
a woman, your body is very policed. Mm -hmm. And so it's been very freeing for me to create these host bodies where I can show these inner evolutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing about your work with us tonight and for making the time to be with us. Yeah, for sure. What time is it where you are? It's not that late. It's oh, 9 30, 9 30. Oh, that's not too bad then. <laughs> I'm happy right. to be here for it. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Thanks, Jillian. Yeah, for sure. Uh, next artist that we're going to talk to is Daniel Labutes. Uh, Daniel's from Calgary, and his work is titled Pink Moon. Uh, Daniel is a studio potter living in Calgary, Alberta. He graduated from AU Arts in 2019 and with a BFA in ceramics. Uh, Daniel, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Awesome. It's nice to see you. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, Daniel, Daniel, you came to ceramics by way of another career as a chef. And um, I was wondering if you could talk about how your work as a ceramicist relates to your work as a chef or to cooking. Um, less and less over time. <laughs> uh, I think when I started out, I saw a lot of similarities in, well, both of them are craft um, and it, it was easy for me to pick it up because of the way I learned how to work. I learned how to work by repetition in the kitchen and you do things over and over all the time until you have it perfect. And so I applied those same skills into learning how to make ceramics. Um, but as time's going on, I, I do still make functional work, but it's I'm moving more towards slightly less functional things. So it doesn't really relate to food as much anymore. Okay. So there's been a, a shift in your work from functional to, to sculptural. Yeah, not so much sculptural, but just less functional. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, if that makes uh, sense. Yeah. Um, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about your ideas about functional work. Um, why it's important or not important. Okay. Um, I think it's important. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that functional work is always always valued because people are using it on a daily basis a lot of the time, or even if it's not being used at the moment, it can still be an object of appreciation in the home. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what I think about with my not quite so functional work is that there'll still be objects appreciated in the home like this like this pot here. It's, it's not likely to be activated with something with flowers or anything like that all the time, but it'll still sit on a shelf and, and be appreciated for what it is. Um, I always have to remind myself that decoration is a function as well. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of value in functional work, but as I continue to make things, I'm less interested in the endless cycle of making mugs and I'm more interested in making larger, more, more interesting pieces or interesting to me pieces. So having an opportunity to express yourself a bit more with the work and not worry so much about the, the end function of the piece. Yeah, exactly. Things to be appreciated just by, by their existence. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much, Daniel, for talking with us. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, our next artist is uh, Dallas Smith. And Dallas is a Calgary engineer turned artist. She received her BFA in glass in 2018 and continued on to obtain a BFA in fiber in 2020, both from AU Arts. Um, this work is titled ASC2 Embroidery. Oh made a mistake reflecting on COVID. Dallas are you there? I'm here hi Jill. Hi how are you? I'm good. It's nice to see you. Can you tell us a little bit about how your work as an artist relates to your mathematical and scientific background as an engineer? When I first 
started in my fine arts degree, I really struggled um, to be artistic or what I thought was artistic. Um, I really wanted to try and get away from the engineer and the structure and the balance and all of those things that were, were so rigid about engineering that to me didn't seem to fit into what I thought was art at that point. Um, I had a breakthrough in one of my sculpture classes, I think it was in the third year of my glass degree, um, where the instructor kind of asked me why the two needed to be mutually exclusive, like why I didn't think engineering and art had a place together. And um, I was always looking for ways to be organic, to have more visually appealing, less structured representations. And he coined the phrase for me, intentionally organic. And what kind of came out of that was using a code and a structure to create something that looks organic, but isn't. So in, in this case, like as an engineer, I spent uh, the last nine years of my career programming. So working with computers and code and computers use something called binary uh, to represent code and represent letters and numbers. And binary consists of ones and zeros or ons and offs or full spaces and empty spaces as you see in the embroidery. Um, and the neat part about that is you can then represent language the same way a computer does in a very subtle way. So no one is going to know by looking at the piece that is, it is an explicit message. It's kind of like that hidden Easter egg in a video game. You don't know it's there unless you go looking at looking for it. And one of the things I remember uh, you mentioned when you were talking about this work was um, the idea of it repeating itself, uh, like Rorschach. Can you talk a little bit about that too? With COVID, I, I was thinking what I could do that was relevant to the current situation. And COVID to me wasn't just a single segment of representation, like just encoding the word COVID-19 didn't, didn't really speak to anything. So I kind of thought about, well, there are so many different viewpoints on COVID right now and so many different opinions and thoughts that I, I took the representation of COVID, which is actually in the top left-hand corner, and then I flipped it and then I reflected it. So there's so many different ways of looking at it and representing it and thinking about it, that it became its own reflection. Hmm. That's really cool. <laughs> Thanks Dallas for talking with us tonight. You're welcome. All right, our next artist is Lael Schmelik. Um, this, this piece is titled Soda Fired rx jar Layla, are you there i am all right <laughs> uh Layla was raised in dawson creek in northern british columbia and began making from an early age joining a long line of obsessive craftsmen she began taking ceramics classes at the age of 14 and from there went on to graduate with the bachelor of fine arts and ceramics from the alberta university of the arts in 2020 so Lael, can you talk to us a little bit about your process and uh, the ideas that you have about how the process shares agency over your work? I think we have a couple of slides of your pieces too. Sure, yeah. Uh, so this piece came about um, as sort of uh, an attempt of mine to re reconcile uh, a complicated relationship with my mental health. Um, I grew up, you know, seeing people uh, using medications uh, related to their mental health, uh, but they were always sort of hidden away in plastic, you know, those plastic containers uh, and kind of secretly tucked away in a cupboard. Uh, and uh, there was always this feeling of sort of shame or secrecy around that. Um, and so I decided to make something for myself um, to make that uh, dependency on medication. Uh, more of a moment of ritual in my day and, uh, you know, this moment of extravagance, like it was something I would almost look forward to getting to interact with these objects. Uh, and also something that I could leave out um, in my house that I just thought was beautiful um, to sort of state that um, I don't have the shame around it, I guess. Um, and you're asking about the agency. Um, what I really love about uh, soda firing, which is the process I use to make this work, uh, is that I, as a maker, and uh, I can uh, know as much as I know at this point in terms of, you know, how to position things in the kiln or how to glaze them to get the results that I'm looking for. Uh, but when I unload the soda kiln, um, because uh, the firing is sort of tumultuous, uh, 
there are always moments that occur in the work that I can't necessarily plan. Uh, and when I try to plan for them, oftentimes um, I'm sort of proved that I don't have that much control. Um, <laughs> and I really love that sort of play. You know, I can I can bring my my uh, skill, but it's also, um, you know, this, um, it almost like removes the skill for me uh, and shows me who's boss, so. That's interesting. Um, can you talk to me about the symbol on the bottom of the lid for your work? Yes, yeah. Um, oh my goodness, I've just forgotten the name of the chemical. Um, oh my gosh. Serotonin, that's the one. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> two <laughs> minutes, thanks. Uh, so to me, um, I've always been really fascinated uh, with the science behind things. Um, and so uh, really it was just kind of a cheeky nod to, uh, you know, if you would see these jars on the mantle, you wouldn't necessarily know that they were for uh, medications relating to mental health. And so it was just sort of this little cheeky reminder underneath, like here's your daily serotonin. Uh, so, yeah, it was kind of my little, you know, we all needed some humor in 2020. So that was my little sneak in. So awesome. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for talking with us, Leo. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Jill. Uh, our next artist is San Xuan. And um, she is the trooper. She's awake and in London, England, um, where I think it is 2 a.m. Uh, and the title of her work is Read My Corpse. Um, San Xuan studied painting and sculpture in China for four years before coming to the jewelry department at OCAD in Ontario. She's recently been accepted to the MFA program at the Royal College of Art in London, England. San Xuan, are you there? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for staying up to talk to us tonight. <laughs> you know, it's very early where you are. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the role of the narrative in your work and uh, talk about your ideas of jewelry as wearable installation? So... <laughs> so I, uh, I just first said I want to uh, talk about the concept behind it. Uh, so this piece uh, on display is like required two people to wear it. Like in this piece, uh, the body of two men have been disassembled and their intestines massively joined together. Uh, like maggots emerge from decking once like flowers in the full uh, bloom. Like at the moment when life ends, uh, we as subjects are transformed into objects. Like for inanimate objects, the material world ceases to exist. So they become part of the observed. And even though the flesh remains, it becomes like observed forever. Oh, this difference is even more impressive when the fresh flesh is de deconstructed and destroyed. Like people see them differently, uh, that is no longer human, and our emotions as well as the attitudes shift. Like it is therefore the precious for the viewer to think when watching my work. Like perhaps there is a, like indifference there will be curiosity and like even discomfort. Uh, it is a case between the inanimate and animate bodies. So uh, like this kind of mental activity is what I expect and it's a part of my concept of the work. So very interesting. It's amazing how beautiful uh, that sort of breaking down of the tissue can be, I mean, the way that you've depicted it here anyway. Um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about the idea of having your work being on people? Like um, in your one of your artist statements, you, um, you talk a little bit about the idea of... Um, uh, 
jewelry as a wearable installation. And I thought that was a really interesting idea that, um, that takes an installation into all sorts of different contexts because someone is wearing it. So thinking about your jewelry that way, I thought was really interesting. So like, uh, I don't know how to say that because like jewelry for me, firstly, is more like, it's really it's installation, but we're on people that like, if you wear on different uh, place on your body, it can represent different concept behind it. Like, not just like you want, you have an idea and you design something and just simply design, design them to a, like a brooch or a necklace. I think like the different place you wear it, it should have a concept, like why, why here? Or why it's a brooch, why place on your head or other place. So, but because jewelry, like traditionally, it is a decoration for the people. And so, <laughs> so I think uh, it has the interaction with your body. So it should uh, have the different concept behind that. Yeah, get it. I, think, I, think, I think that's really interesting. And I don't think I ever really, I mean, it just struck me the way that you said it in your statement and just now that uh, how important it is the, the context of how the person is wearing the jewelry. You know, it's not, it's not just necessarily that jewelry is being worn in a traditional way, the way that it's uh, anticipated to be worn, but it could be worn you know, in a different part of the body, or, you know, it could be worn in all sorts of different contexts as that person moves throughout their day and throughout their community and into different contexts. So anyway, I thought that was really interesting. Like some of, so, uh, so some of my work even like depends on the concept, it could be placed on like on your table and it have the interaction with you like even just a cup or your pen it has a interaction it's also could be called like jewelry because it have the interaction with your body and that would have the different meaning like the decoration so that's yeah. <laughs> i think that's really interesting and i think it's you know it's a way that people can send a message uh is by what they wear as jewelry and how they wear it. So anyway, thanks very much for talking with us tonight. And thanks for being a part of the exhibition. And good luck with your studies. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next artist we'll speak to is uh, Luke. And uh, Luke Winterholt is from Camrose, Alberta. This is Hack Silver Ring. Um, Luke is a Canadian jeweler and metalsmith from Northern Alberta. He studied at the Alberta University of the Arts for four years and is in the process of graduating with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Jewelry and Metals. Um, hey, Luke, are you there? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm here. There he is. Thanks so much for talking with us tonight, Luke. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your ideas about reverse archaeology? So um, as a kid, I always really loved learning about history, just looking at objects from that have survived for so long. Um, you always kind of wonder what the story behind those could possibly be. Um, so a lot of the pieces I make, um, they revolve around this idea where um, you create something that feels old, um, that not necessarily is kind of, you want to make the, you make the things you want to hope to find out in the world somewhere. So in that aspect, it's kind of artificially created uh, form of artifice. Um, so, um, and a lot of that is actually related to the technical process I use for a lot of these. For instance, with the hack silver ring, um, I'm experimenting using a very, very old form of casting, um, specifically sand casting, um, where you take um, a compressed mold of, um, this um, sand that's embedded, um, embedded with oils so that it doesn't um, 
well, so it stays condensed and solid. And then you press in a uh, form that you want to make and you pour in molten metal, that sort of thing. Um, that one actually was um, one of my earliest attempts at trying this technique and um, just looking at how it creates this really old um, worn texture. Um, it just gives it the sense of age that I really love. And um, it also um, helps because I am very kind of a perfectionist when I um, come to making things. So I uh, usually want it to come out very pristine and this kind of forces me to get away from that. Okay. Um, and just kind of forces me to work with what I get um, from it. Mm -hmm. um, weirdly enough from those, that was also an ex um, with the cufflinks, that was an experiment using um, vacuum um, casting where I actually took doilies, embedded it into wax to give it <laughs> that weird fleshy texture. Mm -hmm. And basically behind the idea I have behind this is it makes you wonder how the hell these things have survived for so long, even though they're super new. <laughs> uh, I think that's really, uh, I think that's really interesting and fun. That idea of, you know, creating something to be the ancient thing that you that you want to find. And I think like the the really sort of weathered appearance of these objects uh, really piques your imagination and makes you want to try to figure out who had them or what stories mm -hmm. they're a part of. Anyway, I think they're really interesting. Thank you so much, Luke, for talking with us about your work. Thank you. All right. So our next artist is Leah Guo. And uh, Leo is, Leah is a fifth year BFA glass major studying at the Alberta University of the Arts, whose interdisciplinary practice spans glass blowing, stained glass, analog photography, and lens-based print processes. In the next two years, she will be pursuing a subsequent B uh, Bachelor of Design degree in photography to refine, refine her lens-based bodies of work. Uh, Leah, are you there? Hi, Jill. Hello. Thanks for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure as always. It's nice to see you. Um, and so the two works that you have in the show, uh, Chinook on Nose Hill and Chinook on Moraine, um, are part of a series of photographic work. Um, and I think, you know, your process for making these is really interesting and unusual. And I was hoping that you would talk to us a little bit about what happens in the dark room when you're making these works. Absolutely. Well, um, for me, like the most important thing about these photographs, especially with, with analog photographic processes, is that um, even though you can make multiples, each print turns out to be ever so slightly different because the act of dodging and burning, controlling contrast, all these things are surprisingly very physical, actually quite similar to glass blowing. that the movements of your body, the timing uh, results in a different image every time. And I really wanted to push that uh, with the glass, be because between the moment when the ex exposure machine um, kind of like pulls that light down onto the paper, there is that physical space where things can happen. And typically speaking, and in photography, you never want to interrupt that space. Um, you always want that clean shot, that clean print. Um, and I really wanted to subvert that. And I saw an opportunity to utilize to utilize glasses, um, amazing properties of distortion and refraction uh, within that physical space to affect a negative um, in a way that created a print that is both real and and not real, something that is born of, you know, my own kind of like my hand in making it rather than just, um, you know, just coming from inside the camera and then being repeated upon the paper that it's actually being interrupted uh, by the glass um, and what the light that the glass casts down onto the print. That's really fascinating. I, I love the idea of you almost like controlling the weather in your images by creating these Chinooks. Um, and so when you're making these, do you have blown glass objects on top of the photo paper? Is that what's happening or is it like a photogram? Um, Yes. So, oh gosh, how do I explain this? So if, if the exposure machine is, you know, like it's quite vertical, but let's say there's about around a foot of space at the scale that these uh, prints are at between uh, the lens 
remains of the enlarger and the paper uh, on the table. So it's within that space that I can really like manipulate, you know, how how high off the paper the glass is, where it is, what angle it is. Uh, when I first started these experiments, I was a bit of a chicken. So I just laid the glass on the paper and it became more like a photogram because I was still also learning the technical process of the enlarger and the chemicals. Um, but as I grew more confident, I realized that I had that vertical physical space that I could really work with. And um, as you know, we all instinctively know, but may not, you know, be at the front of our minds, that the farther you move an object away from something in terms of light, like the softer its shadow gets, um, and the more integrated, like the refraction gets. And I found myself being really drawn to um, these moments in the texture where, you know, by manipulating the angle, even the movement between, you know, the 10 seconds that the light is on, uh, I could create these uh, beautiful cloud phenomena uh, that were really like reminiscent of, you know, all these like beautiful windy days or, you know, the stillness of the air. And um, I really wanted to take advantage of that physical space. Well, they're very successful. And I think that they're very evocative as well. Um, the, the sort of fuzzy, mysterious effects of the glass on the, on the print. It's really interesting. Thank you so much for talking with us, Leah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, now the last artist uh, that we will look at tonight is Jared Last. And um, Jared couldn't be here with us this evening. Um, so we did actually record something together uh, over Zoom the other day. But while we're looking at his beautiful work, I'll just uh, read a little bit about Jared. Jared is a Calgary-born artist recently relocated to Revelstoke, BC. He holds a BFA in glass from the Alberta University of the Arts, having graduated in 2016. Um, Jared is, uh, has just finished up a, a stint at Harborfront Centre as a resident artist and is now living in uh, Revelstoke and is part of a studio there uh, called Big Eddie Glassworks. Um, and in the following video clip, Jared talks a little bit about the concepts behind his work pictured here, uh, circuit. From the conceptual standpoint, this piece has taken quite a arduous amount of labor and time, um, but ultimately what I'm trying to make with my artwork is glass pieces that aren't necessarily so I guess like to explain it in a sort of layman's terms, a glass vessel or vase has a intrinsically functional purpose. You look at it and immediately understand what it's for. And maybe it doesn't require any more than sort of a passive understanding of what this item made of this material does. Mm -hmm. um, everyone knows it they know what glass cups or glass water glasses are for or vases etc um, and so when i am making sculpture in particular i'm trying to make pieces that maybe are made of glass but don't immediately read as any type of functional piece uh, but still encourage like another huge impetus for me is uh engagement with a work uh, I really like to make things that people want to interact with and experience, not necessarily touch. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you do view the exhibition, please don't touch my work. Um, don't scratch it. But to experience it and from like sort of a different light. Um, so it's whenever people view the work in a gallery space where they're capable of viewing it around, they're always walking around it, viewing it from different angles, looking at it from all kinds of stuff. And uh, also often trying to sort of touch their fingers between the middle of the piece, because a lot of people aren't really cognizant of the fact that it's a hollow sculpture. It's, uh, it's just a piece of glass with two holes on both sides. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have sort of trouble visualizing or understanding that. So, I like to see that from it because, again, with this sort of passive understanding of glass as a material or the things that you make out of glass, like nobody like has, everyone knows what a window is, but nobody needs to like conceptually understand what a window is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, 
like glass has a lot of sort of utilitarian purposes like that uh, that we don't really regard it as sort of this other medium so making something that people like want to engage with want to understand uh, is really interesting to me because typically glass in the museum setting is like heavily guarded and alarmed so that you don't interact with it at all mm -hmm. because it's supposed to just be viewed as a delicate precious pretty thing um, and not that my work is not like that but it definitely makes you want to see it a little bit differently that's great and so that's our presentation of the artist's work and the exhibition and um i invite you to uh use the chat or um get our attention and ask any questions that you might have and i'm kind of hoping that the artists from the show will have questions for one another. So does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? I don't see any questions in the chat so far, um, but I think this has been a lovely talk. So if any of the artists wants to ask questions at this point or anybody else from the audience, please feel free to unmute um, one at a time and go ahead. I have so many questions, but I don't want to hog the whole night. Um, hmm, I'll throw one out to all of you. What are some of the most challenging things you faced as an emerging artist? And what are some of the most supportive things that you've either experienced or seen at other organizations um, as an emerging artist that have helped in your career? I'll start. I can go. <laughs> um, Graham here. Um, I one of the hardest things was both graduating and getting out into the real world, but also graduating during COVID was a really weird one. And I had quite a few post graduate plans that were involved in my career as an emerging artist. And I found it COVID kind of put a hold on a lot of those things, especially with glass blowing, where it involves being in a studio and working with other people and having the assistance and having your mouths touch metal pipes during a <laughs> epidemic is kind of a tough thing to come across. So that was that was a hurdle, definitely. And to speak towards some of those things as well that have been the best, it's also the community that makes it easy to be an emerging artist. Like in Calgary, I'm fortunate enough to have a studio here in town that I rent blow time from and that's been great to just interact with local artists and fellow glass blowers that help propel your career forward and give you new ideas and different views on the work that you're making and and give you the opportunity to have help and hands when you can't really make everything on your own so thanks graham does anyone else want to jump in with an answer or a I, I kind of have something similar to what Grant, I mean, it's difficult finding space that has been a challenge, but I think it's been its own boon as well, because for me, it's forced me to be a lot more resourceful and to take, you know, just the, the artistic way of thinking and apply that to different media or different ways of using media. So it's, I think it's made us all a lot more resourceful in how you go forward and make craft um, at this point and where the world is at. May I ask a question? My name is Hiska Gerding. And uh, I am not necessarily the artist, but the observer and have appreciation for art and the various forms of art. So the exhibit, as you have it right now, does it, for instance, also have the purpose to reach collectors? Yes, please come visit us. <laughs> no, of course, um, we're happy to have collectors and customers come to the space. And we have a lot of really enthusiastic staff who are trained in multiple craft mediums themselves and are really happy to, 
talk to anyone about the artists and their work or connect them and find deeper information if we need to. So for collectors, in one of the last shows that we had, we reached out to artists just to get more in-depth information on some backstory, on a bit of narrative, on some pieces for them that helped um, make that purchase. But yes, collectors are a huge and important part of the craft ecosystem. As much as we, as artists, like to buy each other's work and support each other, we definitely need other people coming in and appreciate you coming tonight. But yes, definitely the collector is a very important and difficult to reach sometimes part of the craft ecosystem. Thank you. Hiske, do you live in Edmonton? I do live in Edmonton and I have a great and abiding love for the arts and has, have had that since I was little. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. And so I'm very glad with your presentation. I very much enjoyed the introduction of the individual artists because it gives a different perspective. Thank you, Hiske. And there's another question in the chat that I'm going to throw to Megan Black. Megan Black is the director of the Canadian Crafts Federation and a big supporter of craft artists across the country and did a lot for advocacy over the last year and a half for our artists. So Megan, thanks so much for joining us from Fredericton tonight. I'm super happy to be here and glad to have uh, had the invitation sent my way just to flag this for me. Um, I, I totally echo what his said about um, like, I'm really impressed to see so many pieces from so many emerging artists from across the country. You know, sometimes with the provincial craft councils, they focus primarily and, and reasonably so on their own region, but it's really exciting to see a sort of a cross section of work from all over the place. Um, it's like a miniature ecosystem of, of emerging craft, and uh, it's, you know, there wasn't a piece in the show I didn't love. So, congratulations to all of you. Um, I just want to sort of ask a really generic question, but I'm curious to know what's what's next. You know, this whole exhibition is called Coming Up Next. This is the work that you've just done, but what's coming up next for you, whether it's like something that you want to learn or a tool that you need access to or, or something that you're looking forward to creating next. I'm just curious, what's on the docket? No pressure. You're also allowed to just revel in the success of your current moment. <laughs> But I do like to know sort of like, what's the next step that you want to take? I guess I'll go. Um, uh, over the summer, I have, I've realized, especially over the past year as well, that um, especially with the work that I do, uh, I need a lot of control over my studio space. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do without the amazing resources at my school. But as I'm getting towards, you know, the end of graduation, as I'm sure many of the other artists realize here, there's that impending sense of anxiety that I won't have a place to work. And so over the past summer, I've been building my own studio shed. Um, it's almost finished. The uh, electricians came in there last Wednesday and they're working away over the next week. So I'll finally have power after six months of hard work. Uh, I'm really excited because I've arranged it so that I can really take care of my health because I work with chemicals and a lot of, you know, glass debris. So I've made sure to install, you know, ducting and all that. And uh, it's going to be great because I can change it to a dark room when I need it to be a dark room um, for my analog work. And then I can switch it back to a regular studio anytime I want to do, uh, you know, my stained glass work or, you know, some small scale flame working. So it's going to be great. Um, and I feel so lucky that I'm in a position financially and physically to, you know, have a space like that. It's, um, it's just been an amazing journey. It's been a big hit to my pocketbook. I'm going to admit right now, <laughs> but I'm hoping that, um, it'll pay off in terms of sustainability to my health and to my practice, uh, in general. Cause, um, yeah, I want to keep doing this work and I'm sure I echo all of us when we say that, you know, we, we never want to stop creating. Um, so it's just one more step to get to that point. <laughs> I'll go next, if that's all right. Um, I've spent the last two months in the Delta um, doing a residency here. Um, my, I, end, I end up here on Friday and I've got two kilns to fire before that. Um, so I have come down here to create a new body of work. I've been primarily focusing on soda firing and I'll be doing the salt firing as well. And 
working in larger scale as much as I can. And so I've been doing that and in hopes that as I move forward in my career, I'll have uh, a bit of a new direction and a new exciting focus. Uh, I'm happy to go next if we have the time still. Um, so I was like, uh, like you were talking about Graham with um, like plans being postponed and things like that. Well, um, I was like really, really fortunate to be able to go to the Icelandic Textile Center this past August to do a residency that I'd planned like two and a half years ago. And so um, what's coming up next for me is I'd like to return to the center. They've invited me to do an internship there. And so I really am so fascinated by the, the loom, like the floor loom. And they have a beautiful collection of Scandinavian looms that well, many of them were made in Iceland. And so learning about those looms, like helping refurbish those looms and, and teaching other fiber artists about them is something I'm very, very passionate about. So I'm hoping to return um, in the spring. And then I have another residency plan for June to go to France. So, um, so yeah, I'm really excited about the upcoming things, but of course there's always room for, for change and, and just going with the flow because that's, that's kind of been the theme. So, but as long as things you know, continue to progress, it's very um, heartening. I guess I can go next. Um, for me personally, it's more so um, trying to get um, technical processes down um, a little more um, cleanly um, and potentially looking for apprenticeship opportunities um, in Alberta. Um, I'm willing to move for it, but yeah, I just kind of want to expand my skill set more so um, and potentially looking for collaborative pieces. I have a friend in Red Deer who um, I've been thinking of starting some work with. So yeah, that's about it. I can go next. Um, at post-graduation, I obtained a scholarship to go up to the Yukon and work at a glass blank studio for a month. And it's a scholarship that, that AU Arts gives to students. And unfortunately, due to COVID, Yukon kind of shut their borders and I didn't want to travel at that point. So I kind of, even if the opportunity was there, I limited myself from doing that. But hopefully they say they're going to honor that scholarship and so hopefully after this year's graduating with the second BFA I'll be able to go up there and work for that month and gain a little bit of studio experience for just living working and biking to the hot shop and as far as like far goals go I would I have aspirations to pursue a MFA somewhere at some point I actually have a dream to go to the Royal College of Art. So that is something that I would love to pursue. And we'll see if that comes up and what happens until then. But yeah, there's quite a few expansive goals that are in the works. I can go next. So my plans are to be something bigger bead something more bead something that's never been beaded before i have uh, some exhibitions coming up a few of them and one in spring at the fazakis gallery where you'll see more of my beaded face images and other pieces that have never been beaded before yeah. and marcy i just saw a few of your pieces in the breathe exhibition of masks that is traveling around the country. Megan um, helped jury that show and write an article about it for Garland Craft Magazine that's out of the out of Australia. So congratulations on being a part of that exhibition. Those pieces are fantastic too. Yeah, thank you. That breathe, those breathe exhibitions are quite amazing. And yeah, something that has really helped me when COVID hit. Uh, that's when I became an artist around the same time too. So it really was so therapeutic and yeah, it was a great group to be, to be, to be a part of. Yeah. And your masks definitely stood out. You have such a handle on the technical skill of beating. Um, and it's, it's really exciting to see you 
expressing that in different ways with the portraiture as well. Yeah, thank you, Jenna. All right, does anyone else want to share their hopes and dreams? Uh, I can look <laughs> if we have time. Oh, Adrian. No, absolutely. Ahead. Me next or? Yeah, you go ahead. I'll go um, oh, hi, Lael. Um, hi. Yeah, I have a space at Workshop Studios and uh, it's pretty wonderful. So I go there most days and think about what I'm going to do next. And I'm planning to make some more sculptures with linen this time and maybe something kind of darker, thinking a bit more ominous. So we'll see what happens with that. But I, I would like to create another group of sculptures that are sort of along the same lines of what I did, but a sort of new theme. Uh, okay, I will go next. Um, I'm uh, actually gonna answer this question. And Jenna, you had mentioned, uh, you were sort of asking, you know, what has helped uh, as emerging artists, what sort of, um, you know, what, what things have helped. Uh, and what I'm looking forward to coming up next uh, is that I'm actually um, doing a spotlight at the Alberta Crafts Council Gallery in Calgary. Uh, and so um, for me, what has really helped as an emerging artist is just all of these uh, craft, craft institutions that have opportunities available. Uh, because I think otherwise um, it sort of starts to feel like you're, you know, in an echo chamber, just, you know, watching yourself work day after day. Um, and so, um, you know, the Alberta Crafts Council, Canadian Crafts Federation, things like that. Um, just having those opportunities available is, um, you know, that's kind of the light at the end of the tunnel, I think that keeps us all working, which uh, is really encouraging. So thank you. That's really, thank you for saying that. That's really nice to hear. It's been mm -hmm. a challenging time to be an arts administrator and we all started off as an emerging craft artist. So we are mm -hmm. deeply sympathetic. <laughs> to your <laughs> plight or your career. And we try to do everything that we can to help make that easier and create opportunities. And I think from my roots as a ceramics grad from AU Arts or ACAD back then was just seeing how many talented course mates that I had who didn't have the confidence to approach a gallery or think that they belonged in a shop like the Craft Council and that that was a space for their teachers. And so that from very early on in my career has been a mission to try and ensure that emerging crafts people had a space or a show like this that they could have their work in. Um, and <laughs> my stubbornness in that was what started the show nine years ago and it restarted when I came back to the craft council because it's always been one of my favorite shows in our calendar and it's so great to show our collectors and customers all these amazing new talented people coming up in the medium and just are in the craft sector and just getting excited about what people are creating and we really tried to push it more nationally this year because we really do know that you guys move around to find opportunities and to find space or mentorships and apprenticeships and that you're not necessarily you're going where you can keep making and I hope that in the future, we can make sure that this show is bigger and has scholarships and travels to more provinces because it absolutely should. And it's of the caliber that we could and should hopefully be sending it to other countries to represent what's being created here too. So thank you all for being a part of this show. And Megan, we'll just have to scheme on how we can get this to like further afield. <laughs> I'm always up for a good scheme. Uh, yeah. I'll just say to all of you too, like, I feel like if you have an opportunity in front of you, if you're making a choice between, should I, should I go for the big thing or should I keep it in place safe? Like always take that opportunity, always take the risk um, because you've already taken so many risks in your, in your life and in your career to get where you're at right now. Don't let that stop you now, just keep going. Yeah, and I think just reach out to your craft councils. We're all passionate craft nerds and we just want you to succeed and create opportunities that can help. So if you have ideas around what could help, we're definitely, Megan and I have applied for some chunky federal grants to try and start some apprenticeship and mentorship programs. The Alberta Craft Council is hell bent on trying to figure out how to build a space like Medelta so that there can be more opportunities for artists to keep making their work because we know that's one of the biggest challenges that you guys face but definitely 
um, keep the communication flowing. We're always happy to see you in person at the spaces or just uh, send us an email and tell us what your challenges are and we'll see what we can do to mine that network to help you out the best that we can too. All right, well, that might be the end. <laughs> Jill, did you have any questions? Parting words of wisdom. Jill, so a few of these people in this exhibition have been your past students and you ask so many thoughtful questions because you are also ha have spent a good portion of your time as an educator at AU Arts in Glass. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks for all your thoughtful questions. I can see some of those reflected in some of your former students. <laughs> it was really lovely to talk to everyone tonight. I really enjoyed hearing what you all had to say. And it just means so much to us that you came out and took the time to, to do that with us. Um, I just, I guess I just want to remind everyone about the great resources that we have on our website for this show. We have um, the artist's bios and statements and images of the work and the exhibition. And so I hope if you want to see some more, you'll look there if you aren't able to come into our locations, but hopefully you'll be able to come in and see the work in person in Edmonton or later in Calgary in the early uh, 2022 showing that's happening at Sea space um, And that's all that I have to say. Thanks everyone. It was really nice to see all of you. And hopefully when the time comes for this exhibition to be in Calgary, we can be together in person, or at least a few of us can be. And we definitely plan to have more chats like this. So please stay connected and hopefully we'll see you in person one day soon. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>